Welcome to the Radical Truth Podcast. I am your host, Glenn Meldrum, and this podcast is brought to you by In His Presence Ministries. Visit us on the web at www.ihpministry.com. The topic of our last lesson was the Apostle's sham trial that was executed by the same people who illegally tried Jesus and condemned him. The high priest made his accusations against the apostles, and they gave a simple yet profound response to those bogus charges. Their response was more like a sermon of an evangelist, for it exposed the guilt of those hypocrites' hearts. That confrontational message didn't endear the apostles to the Sanhedrin council. Quite the opposite. It infuriated them to such a point that he wanted to kill the apostles. Gamaliel, who was a famed rabbi and a member of the Sanhedrin Council, spoke a word of sanity to those men who were acting insane by stating in Acts chapter 5, verse 35, Men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do to these men. That was some very good advice, which the Sanhedrin only partially listened to, since they severely abused the apostles anyway. At least they didn't kill them, like those nice religious leaders wanted to do. Now we will pick up with the argument Gamaliel made to the Sanhedrin. In verse 36, Gamaliel, who taught Paul the doctrine and practice of the Pharisees, stated, Some time ago Thaddeus appeared, claiming to be somebody, and about 400 men rallied to him. He was killed and his followers were dispersed. It all came to nothing. Who is Thaddeus? We really don't know, but there's a lot of speculation on who this man was. Thaddeus was a common Jewish name, so it makes it a little harder trying to nail down who he is. The facts about his life and rebellion may be lost to us, other than what we are told in this one verse. The Jewish historian Josephus recorded an account of an insurrectionist named Thaddeus, but this event is reported to have happened 10 to 15 years after the event we are studying. It's been suggested by some that Josephus got his dates wrong. But there's no way to verify this, at least at this point. Another possibility is an insurrection that happened right after the death of Herod the Great by a man named Judas, and Josephus gives an account of this event. There's the possibility that Thaddeus and Judas are the same person. The apostle Judas, not the one who betrayed Jesus, is also called Jude, and in Mark chapter 3, verse 18, he's called Thaddeus. Since we have an account in the gospel of a Judas who is called Thaddeus, then it's possible that such a thing happened in the insurrection Gamaliel is mentioning. Since Judas or Thaddeus made the claim that he was a somebody, we know that he was a very arrogant man. It's said that he was trying to become the king of Israel after the death of Herod the Great. All we know for sure is that the event was well known to the Sanhedrin, and that's why Gamaliel incorporated it into his argument. In verse 37, Gamaliel mentions another well-known insurrection, stating, After him, Judas the Galilean appeared in the days of the census and led a band of people in revolt, who too was killed, and all his followers were scattered. Here's another Judas, who's known as the Galilean. This Judas was different from the one mentioned in the prior verse, and this insurrection happened roughly ten years after Thaddeus began his. There's also a difference in what the insurrections were about. The first was about a man who wanted to be king, so he started a revolution to take the throne by force. The second man was a patriot who wanted to throw off the yoke of Roman tyranny. Here again, we have an event that the members of the Sanhedrin Council knew. Coming to verse 38, Gamaliel continues his argument stating, Therefore, in the present case I advise you, leave these men alone, let them go, For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. One reason why Gamaliel may have made this suggestion was that if the apostles were starting an insurrection, then Rome would crush it, and the Sanhedrin wouldn't need to get another black eye for killing innocent men. Some have made the claim that Gamaliel was a secret follower of Jesus, and this is why he was defending the apostles. There just doesn't seem to be any evidence to support this hypothesis, especially given that his disciple, Paul, passionately hated and persecuted Christians. I commented in our last lesson on the pragmatic solution Gamaliel made and noted that it's not based upon a biblical worldview or the Word of God. The premise is that if it's God's will, then it will succeed, and if it fails, then it wasn't His will. 
There are times that this is true, but it's not a foolproof way of determining God's will. There are times where evil prevails over good, not eternally, but temporarily. The existence of cults and world religions are proof that what Gamaliel said isn't true, since these are certainly not God's will, even though they are prospering in a world of lies. I'm not going to take the time to prove why Gamaliel's pragmatic worldview is wrong, other than through the very simplistic thoughts that I just presented. I will leave you to think through this. Now, if what Gamaliel said was in reference to eternity, then it would be true, but I don't think that's what he was asserting. We know through the extensive teaching of Scripture that the works of the flesh always produce spiritual and eternal death. This means that those who live according to the sinful nature will reap divine judgment. But those who live according to the Holy Spirit will reap eternal life because they put to death the works of the flesh. But because people walk near to Jesus doesn't mean life will be easy or the world will be kind. More than likely, it'll be quite the opposite. According to Gamaliel's logic, the bad guys were brought to nothing because they were in rebellion against God, while those who do God's will are sure to be blessed of God. But this isn't always the case. The rabbi presents this thought in verse 39. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourselves fighting against God. Now, this is certainly true. Though people fight against God, they are in a losing battle. God's will is sure to come to pass, and nothing and no one can prevent it. He is infinite in wisdom and knows how to accomplish His will. And He is infinite in power, so He has the ability to bring it to pass. The Sanhedrin was fighting against God, and they were sure to lose, and they did. Though Gamaliel's speech persuaded them to a certain degree, the Sanhedrin was still filled with hatred for the apostles and wanted to physically hurt them. Verse 40 expresses this. They called the apostles in, had them flogged, then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. The Sanhedrin had no justifiable reason to flog the apostles. Their God-hatred was directed against his ambassadors in a barbaric act of brutality. They were absolute hypocrites. I have wondered whether or not the Sanhedrin actually had the legal right to physically abuse the apostles. The old adage was being acted out, that might makes right, though this is totally a lie. The power and influence of the council was being terribly abused, and this is one major reason why the nation was devastated by Rome in 70 AD. How utterly evil to cloak their wickedness and hate in garments of religion and think that they are right with God when they are at war with Him. Jesus said that if the light that is in people is darkness, then their darkness is all the greater, and the religious elite were in total darkness. The council got away with their cruelty because Rome didn't want to get involved in their religious squabbles, unless forced to do so, as we see in the case of Jesus. Herod the Great divided the kingdom into four smaller kingdoms, and these political rulers didn't want to get involved in the cunning craftiness of the religious elite either. So the Sanhedrin practiced their unethical, immoral religious rules because nobody would take them to task. But they would answer to God, and they did answer to Him and their judgment was terrible. The people were afraid of the council members and the religious elite because of the brutality that they enacted in the name of God. The common folk didn't want to be on the receiving end of their villainy and abuse. Now there was a cruel logic behind the Sanhedrin flogging the apostles. Their thought was that if they physically hurt them bad enough, then they would listen to their command and stop preaching in the name of Jesus. These blind guides didn't count on the reaction of the apostles and the infant church where they counted it a privilege to suffer for Christ so that some people might be saved. Now we come to verses 41 and 42 where we get another glimpse into the life of the early church. This is their second response to being persecuted. In verses 41 we are told, The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. They didn't leave the council chambers with their tails between their legs like a bunch of whipped puppies. They left like conquerors who had just won a decisive battle, and behind them were strewn the bodies of their defeated spiritual foe. It's not that the apostles wanted to suffer persecution, because they didn't. Those who want to suffer have some distorted ways of thinking that's contrary to Jesus and what he taught. 
We should love Jesus enough that we want to follow him wherever that may lead, so that his name is exalted and the lost are saved and discipled. If in the process of obeying his will we suffer for his name's sake, then we can rest on his promises that he will give us all the grace necessary to endure those hardships. The Lord doesn't enjoy seeing his children suffer. A loving father never does. Yet he told us that we would suffer, because when the light breaks into a world of darkness, the darkness will respond with hate and bitterness and wrath. Those who live in the light walk in love towards others, while those in darkness are driven by devils that arouse the hatred and self-love of people. The apostles knew they hadn't done anything wrong, but were arrested, tried, and flogged for doing God's will. They found joy, not in the suffering itself, but in doing God's will in the face of evil and tyranny. They could rejoice that they were thought worthy by God to be dishonored by man for his sake. It's not just that they were filled with joy for being like Jesus. Verse 42 tells us, Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Christ. They weren't being rebellious against the command of the Sanhedrin council. They were being obedient to God. The difference here is extremely important. To purposely be defiant to what the Sanhedrin council commanded would be a revelation of a rebellious spirit. However, to obey God means that the apostles and those early saints would be in direct opposition to the will of the council. The first expression is an act of rebellion. The second is an act of obedience. And the only thing that determines the difference is the condition of the heart and our relationship with Jesus. We could then say that the apostles were fearlessly obedient to Jesus, and that's why they preached in his name the forgiveness of sins in the temple courts where they were arrested and from house to house. They went in public places to reach people so that they could go from house to house to give further instruction on how to become a follower of Jesus and to remain faithful to him. The central theme of the message is that Jesus is the promised Messiah, and this is really good news because it offers us the benefits of the finished work of salvation that the Savior purchased for us on Calvary. And it reveals the indescribable power that's available to us through the power of Christ's resurrection. It's wonderful how they preached this message day after day and in every situation they found themselves in. They did this because they were so thoroughly convinced of who Jesus is and what he came to do that they were consumed with the love and devotion to their Savior. They found great joy in proclaiming the good news and in seeing people turn from the power of darkness into God's glorious light of salvation. This is what we need in the true church today. As we begin studying Acts chapter 6, the first seven verses speak about the growth of the primitive church and of one particular challenge that came through that growth. It's right for genuine followers of Jesus to want to see his church to grow. Yet with church growth comes the messiness associated with sinners that are being saved. Think of it like this. Newborn babies may bring joy to the home, but they're very messy and they will wear you out. As sinners, we are in constant need of the Savior to save us from ourselves, and this is true all the days of our life. When we get to heaven, our sin nature will be eradicated as it's swallowed up in Christ's victory. Then we will no longer be sinners in need of a Savior, for then we will be fully redeemed and our sins will be no more. Yet we will forever need the Savior, for our very existence will depend upon Him. We will then understand more fully that Jesus is our life and salvation. Until the day we are clothed the incorruptible and know the joy of full redemption, we must live with each other as redeemed saints that need to die to our old Adamic nature on a daily basis. As the church grows, those who come into the body of Christ bring with them God's great salvation and their old sinful nature. There are many more problems in the primitive church than what's recorded in the New Testament. Those church problems that we read about in Scripture are the ones the Lord knew would be helpful lessons for us in our situations. We had recently studied the challenging account of church discipline with Ananias and Sapphira. What we are going to see in the beginning of chapter 6 is the sin of prejudice and how that was addressed in a practical way. This sin can slither its way into the church in a host of ways. It could even rise up as a result of persecution and suffering. 
The sin of prejudice is real, and it's a problem every person, people, and nation experience. The church needs to properly address this sin, otherwise it will corrupt individual believers and even whole churches. The early church was in revival, but revival can only do certain things, and there are other things it can't do. Revival brings people into Christ's kingdom in vast numbers and in a short period of time. It brings saints and sinners to repentance, and there's power and grace available to help people fall in love with Jesus. Revival can't disciple people. That's the responsibility of the church. So revival sweeps into Christ's kingdom sinful people who repent and surrender to Jesus. But it's discipleship that teaches them how to live out the biblical faith. We see one challenge of this explosive growth that's laid out in verse 1 of Acts chapter 6. In those days when the number of disciples were increasing, the Grecian Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. To understand the conflict that was going on, we need to understand the differences between Grecian and Hebraic Jews. To you and I, this difference may seem frivolous. Grecian Jews were descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob but were born outside of Israel, and Greek was their first language. Hebraic Jews were born in Israel and spoke the native language, which was Aramaic, not Hebrew. Aramaic was a Semitic language of Syria, Mesopotamia, and Israel from 300 B.C. to around 650 A.D. This was the everyday man's speech, while Greek was the trade language of the Roman Empire. After the Babylonian captivity, Hebrew had become the religious language of the Jews because most of them couldn't speak or read it. The Septuagint, which is the oldest Greek Old Testament, was written in Kony Greek, which is also referred to as Hellenistic Greek. The Septuagint was written for Grecian Jews. Most scholars believe that the Pentateuch, or the first five books of Moses, was completed in the early part of the 3rd century B.C., over the next two centuries, the remaining books were translated. This Greek translation is called the Septuagint, which means 70. According to tradition, the first five books of the Old Testament were translated by 70 or 72 Jewish scholars, six from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. In the account we are studying, the problem arose between the Hebraic and Grecian Jews because Hebraic Jews looked down upon Grecian Jews, treating them like second-class citizens. This prejudice was transferred into the church and had become such a problem that those who were helping poor widows were treating the Hebraic Jews better than the Grecian Jews. The Grecian widows may have at times been totally neglected by those who were distributing whatever help the church was offering. Now it appears that all these widows belonged to the church and that the believers were striving to help them. How they came to poverty we aren't told, but there may be many possibilities, but I'll just touch on two of them. Elderly parents were cared for by their children. This was the cultural norm since they didn't have nursing homes to send them off to when they became a burden. A thought like that would have been reprehensible at that time and in that culture. The fact that those widows who had adult children were refused to be taken care of by them means that the widow was rejected for some serious offense. The most plausible cause for such harsh treatment was that they were being rejected because of their faith in Christ. Another reason why a widow could become destitute was if she didn't have any living children to take care of her. However they came to this place of severe want, the church had freely taken upon herself the responsibility to care for them. Given that this prejudice was causing problems in the church, the solution had to come through the leadership, which at this time was the apostles. We see their stepping up to lead the infant church in verses 2-4. through four. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom and turn this responsibility over to them and we will give our attention to prayer in the ministry of the word. The discrimination between the Hebraic and Grecian widows may have been something the apostles didn't even know was happening until knowledge of it came to them. I would imagine that they investigated the matter well enough to see the need for good leadership under their oversight so the problem could be solved. The answer was to release capable men into the place of leadership where they could bring proper order to the ministry to widows and eliminate any discrimination. 
Though this act would solve the problem of the inequitable treatment of widows, it wouldn't change the hearts of the people that caused the problem in the first place. Helping people get free from prejudice can be very difficult because they must first be brought to the truth that their prejudice is evil and that they have believed lies to continue in the practice of hate and bitterness. To expose the wickedness in people's hearts is the first step to their repentance. But those who don't want to repent will most often grow angry at those who unmask their sin. Because people want to justify their sin, and this includes the sins of hate, bitterness, and prejudice, they want to feel that their bitterness or prejudice is justified. They point out what people had done to them or to their family, people group, or nation. Yet Jesus commanded us to love our enemies, to do good to those who hate us, and to pray for those who persecute us. Therefore, we don't have any justifiable reason to be bitter, hateful, or prejudiced. The Lord won't sanction our excuses for not living out God's love through divine grace. What recourse did the apostles have in dealing with the heart corruption of bitterness, hate, and prejudice? To preach the word without compromise or fear of man, and this stands true today. Preachers and teachers must prove through Scripture how bitterness, hate, and prejudice are evil, Therefore they are sin, and sin always separates people from God. Then there must be preaching and teaching on how to love family, friends, and enemies in a Christ-like, selfless manner. To be able to love in this way, we need the power of the Holy Spirit working in and through us, for He is our agent of grace in this wicked world. This is why we need good, sound, Pentecostal teaching and preaching on the Holy Spirit, so we can see the Spirit's power working in and through us. The translation I read said that the twelve had gathered all the disciples together. This is a challenging thought because there were well over 5,000 disciples at this time, and the numbers could have been easily double that if you add in recent converts along with the women and children. The King James Version wrote that they called the multitude of the disciples, while the Net Bible used the whole group, and the 1984 NIV rendered it as all the disciples. The Greek word means fullness and pertains to a large number, company, or multitude. We see from this that the 1984 NIV didn't give the best translation for this verse. The apostles had called together a large number of believers to address the issue of how widows were not being treated fairly, and we learn from this that it had become a big problem in the church. The way to deal with the problem was to face it head on through the love and compassion of God, and this is what the apostles did. To ignore the problem or dance around the issue would have only exasperated it. From the large crowd that gathered, they could seek the will of God on the matter and be able to find a working solution, so long as everyone was walking in the Spirit and the love of God. I imagine that people were complaining to the apostles about the unjust favoritism shown by those who were caring for the widows, and they probably felt pressured to do something to rectify the problem. Some may have said that it was the responsibility of the apostles to oversee the care of the widows, but as we will soon see, this is a very wrong approach to New Testament ministry. Pastors today face the same erroneous mindset that blames them for the lack of people serving in ministry. Whatever ministry is lacking in the local church, then the congregation often blames the pastor. Yet they refuse to take responsibility themselves to supply the need. One reason why pastors and their spouses burn out is due to the pressure they feel from the congregation. The apostles had the right answer to the situation. It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word in order to wait on tables. We must be faithful to God's call upon our lives. The apostles were called to pray, fast, and preach the word. They weren't called to take care of widows. This means that others were called to take care of the need, and they must rise up to obey God. To minister outside of our calling causes us to burn out. It's where we overextend ourselves. In an ideal world, every member of the church would be operating in their calling, and every need would be met as a result. But we don't live in an ideal world, and a vast portion of the church refuses to serve within the church. God's design for the church is wonderful. But if we aren't living surrendered to the Lord, then the church is going to lack in one way or another. The solution to the problem was not for the apostles to minister outside of their calling, but to raise up and release in the ministry those who are capable and called. Their suggestion was to choose seven men as the first deacons to oversee the care of widows. 
There's nothing mysterious why they chose seven men, so we don't want to read more into this than necessary. I would venture to say that the need had become large enough that it took seven men to oversee this compassion ministry. The first deacons didn't run the finances of the church. They didn't run the church either. They cared for needy widows, and they didn't tell the apostles what to do or dictate to the congregations. They were called to serve others and not to be the Lord or dictator over pastors or apostles, and I have seen this happen all too often. In our present-day church culture, it's not wrong for deacons to help oversee the finances of the local church, but they should do it humbly under the leadership of the pastor. Those deacons that seek to control the pastor and the church are themselves out of control. They are out of God's will and in rebellion against God's ordained position of the pastor. Out of all the rebellion I have seen by deacons, there's an underlying theme. They don't have the spiritual life that the apostles declared a deacon should have. This is very important here. Before anyone accepts the position of a deacon, they should first be able to prove that they are living out the two character requirements that the apostles listed. Those two requirements are being full of the Holy Spirit and full of wisdom. Anyone who doesn't live out these two characteristics shouldn't accept the position of a deacon because they will be judged more strictly for taking a church office. If deacons were full of the Holy Spirit, then they wouldn't be full of the flesh. That means they wouldn't be a nightmare to the pastor, but a blessing and a support to him. If they were full of the Holy Spirit, they wouldn't be contentious, divisive, or arrogant. Instead, they would be godly armor bearers to the pastor and not be numbered among the pastor's worst enemies. To be full of the Spirit is to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, for that's surely how the Spirit-filled apostles would have understood it. People who are full of the Holy Spirit are in deep abiding relationship with Jesus, and that means they are people who are much in prayer and deep in the study of God's Word. The vast number of deacons I have known are virtually prayerless, and prayerless people are not full of the Holy Spirit, and as a result, they are not full of godly wisdom. If deacons aren't full of wisdom, which refers to wisdom that comes through the power of the Holy Spirit, then they are full of worldly wisdom, which is sure to do serious damage to a church. Prayerless deacons make their decisions out of the works of the flesh that are contrary to the will of God. Prayerless deacons aren't surrendered to God. Therefore, any direction they lead the church in is done through the works of the flesh and the wisdom of man that brings death. If you're a prayerless deacon, then you need to immediately resign your position because you are harming the church and bringing judgment on your own soul. You need to have the fear of God. There's another alternative, though, and that's to repent to your pastor and to repent before the whole church about your sinful, selfish ways and get right with God. Then become a man or woman of prayer that's full of the Holy Spirit and full of wisdom. Thank you for listening to The Radical Truth with your host, Glenn Meldrum. We at In His Presence Ministries pray that this weekly podcast will be a blessing to you. Please tell others about it and subscribe yourself to this free podcast. Don't forget to visit our website at www.ihpministry.com. See you again next time, and may God richly bless you as you seek Him in spirit and in truth. So come wash in the river Come drink your fill Let healing waters Bear away your guilt Lay down your burden